questions asked, right? We're still doing them right at the end of the first. That's fine. Okay, all right. So, um, calculate the number of moles. Well, what what three ways did we did we talk about in Malaysia to define moles before? Oh, PV. Yeah. PV equals NRT. Molar mass. Molarity of solution. That's the only three. So, have we got a solution? Have we got a number of grams given to us of gas? No. No, which makes this a PV pertinent. PV equals NRT question. Calculate moles of C2H4. Well, what would the P be? 0.822 ATMs. What would the B be? 0.0854. The temperature would be 305. Which R value would you use? The one that says atmospheres. Don't just pick one. I like this one. Right? So you got to pick the one that matches, 0.08201. And you will find an answer there for the moles that are actually produced. If you look at part B down here at the bottom, and again I apologize for the screen, but if you look at part B at the bottom, they want you to calculate the percent yield. How do you calculate percent yield when you do the story count? You do the actual over theoretical or the experimental over the, whatever you call it. You need an actual number and you need a theoretical number. Where's your actual number coming from? <laughs> Letter A, part I. Calculate the number of moles that are, sorry, calculate, yeah, that are actually produced. So you get an answer. Part II, how much would be produced if it ran all the way to completion? So do you know the grams of ethanol? Does the problem tell you grams of ethanol? Yeah, it is. 0. 0.200. 0. <coughs> so can you work a stoichiometry problem from grams of ethanol over to moles of ethane? Yes, By changing grams to moles, using... Uh, an equation that's balanced, which this one is, luckily. Can you go from grams of ethanol to grams of ethane? And that would give you an actual here, using pervert. Subpart II would give you the theoretical, going from grams of ethanol to moles of ethane. And then if you just divided the actual number of moles by the theoretical number of moles, you would get a percent yield. Now, y'all tell me, how many points do you think this would be worth? That's about five. Four, four five. five. Where would you get five from? Showing your work. You may want to go two. I mean, to me, it seems like one, two, three, maybe three. I mean, this, this is not AP Chem. This is all I took chemistry. I took chemistry the first semester. Typically, you're getting to somewhere around stoichiometry, right? So none of this is like, uh, AP, super hard, thermo, uh, that's not this. But yet, when you look at the points, oops, wrong button. When you look at the points, uh, and I, again, I apologize for this dark spot, but you get one point for finding the dry pressure of the gas. In other words, it told you the total pressure collect, collected over water. And when you collect a gas over water, you're supposed to take out the vapor pressure due to the water. So it tells you that the entire pressure was 0.822, and it tells you that the vapor pressure is 35.7. You're supposed to correct that. You're supposed to say this much atmospheres was due to the water vapor, 
And you're supposed to correct that. Now, it's been a while. I get it. You probably have not done one of those problems, maybe ever. But you would have gotten one point for correcting that. You would have gotten one point for finding the number of moles of ethene gas. You would have gotten one point for working a regular stoichiometry problem. And you would have gotten one point for finding a percent yield. There's actually four points buried in here. Now, you may want to guess, well, you haven't even seen the whole question. You may want to guess how many, what was the average this year, 2015, number one? Two. The average was a 3.8. Four points are here. Even if you only got two points, you can still pick up other points on into the question. My point here is that when you sit down to answer these questions, you will not get every single one of them right. Hardly ever. The average is usually less than half. And yet the average score on the AP exam is a three. So your, your goal is to try and get half the points or better. Right? Knowing that you oftentimes won't get all ten points or all four points in a question. Your goal is to get at least half. Now don't set your bar so low. Don't go, I got three points. I'm good. <laughs> right? You want to try and get as many as you can, but it's totally okay to miss these. And I will tell you, I have seen questions where 20% of the 140,000 people who answer that question, 20% are zeros and blanks. They never answer the question, or they answer the question and don't get any points. They can't do this. And y'all are smarter than that. So just realize you're in a better place than a lot of people that can't even go grams to grams. Or grams to moles, sorry. Okay? Seem fair kind of thing? Right. So can you hit the skate for me? If y'all could turn over to session three real quick, solids, liquids, and gases. Just, there you go. Here. Let me get out of your way. You're good. Let's go right there. Session C, states of matter and intermolecular forces. All right, now, I am going to guess from the teacher's point of view that y'all have not gotten to this. Everything that we're going to talk about today is a review, not from AP Chemistry class, it's a review from what you learned in chemistry or in eighth grade. <laughs> You know, you thought that physical <coughs> science thing where they solve liquids and gases and those kinds of things. Intermolecular forces. So this is an awful lot of you guys making sure what you need to know on the AP exam. So if you look in the packet, it says what I absolutely have to know in order to survive the AP exam. Now I'm not going to tell you that you need to go home and study that this weekend. But I am going to tell you, I'm going to want you to take this packet and I'm going to want you to hang on to it into the spring so that when you, as you're coming up to May 7th, you go, aha, dude with a bacon shirt said, there's a lot of really helpful information in that sucker about what do I need to review, what do I need to know, those kinds of things. So my estimation is that everybody in the room is going to be really bad at what we're doing right now because it's been a long time. So if you're doing really bad on it, you're doing exactly what I want you to do. How many times have you heard a teacher say that? You wish. All right, so solids. Just in general, we got crystalline solids and amorphous solids. Can y'all give me a for instance of a crystalline salt? Something held in crystals. Salt, very good. And an amorphous salt. Glass. Glass. Okay, asphalt, plastic, things like that. 
Now, that's not incredibly important, but we should know that solids have very strong intermolecular forces. I call it the run through it test. Let's play the run through it test. You get to run through three things water, air, and a brick wall. Which one is the easiest to run through? Air. Good job. So guess who has the least intermolecular forces holding them together? Air. Air. When you run through water, is it easy? No. When you jump into water, do you get out of the way or does the water get out of the way? The water gets out of the way. When you jump onto concrete <laughs> from a great height, that was good, like a sound effect. Mm -hmm. When you jump on concrete from a great height, do you get out of the way or does concrete get out of the way? You get out of the way. When you're facing concrete, concrete's got stronger intermolecular forces than you do. You become a smear, sh right? Unless you're like. <clears throat> Superhero power. Yeah, superhero power, something or other. All right, crystalline solids just have a regular repeating structure. So you got sodium, you got chlorine. What's right next to the chlorine? <coughs> another sodium, and then another chlorine, and then a sodium, a regular repeating structure, a crystalline solid. Okay, ionic solids. How do you know if something is ionic or not? It has a charge, but how do you know just looking at it if it has a charge? KNO3. Um, it's ionic. Why is it ionic? Non-metal, metal. Because it's got a metal in it, right? So a metal and a non-metal is an ionic solid. Crystalline solids tend to be what we call salts. AgCl, got a metal. So that would be an ionic salt. How can you test for an ionic salt? What do you think? How can you test to see if something is an ionic salt? If it's a conductor? So if I have a piece of salt, like just a big salt, will it conduct electricity? You'd have to dissolve it with water. And then if it dissolved in water and it's electrolyte, then it'll conduct electricity. Think about salt. Does it melt? How hot does salt have to be to melt? Not not dissolve, melt. Like how high? Like 350? Put it in your oven, 350 degrees for half an hour. 2,000 degrees? You talking Fahrenheit or Celsius? Fahrenheit. Okay. Kelvin. Sure. Sure. Turns out it's somewhere around 700 degrees Celsius. That tells you that it's got crazy strong intermolecular forces. Those, those attractions between positive and negative ions are crazy strong. Because it doesn't melt until it gets really hot. Which is why you can walk down to a fancy cooking store and they will sell you a block of salt to cook stuff on. Put it in the oven, put a piece of fish on it. The fish cooks, you take the piece of salt, you wash it off. By the, time, by the way, every time you wash off a piece of salt, you're just washing off more salt. <laughs> they sold you a cookie sheet that over time will go away. <laughs> but people are like, look at me, I'm cooking on Himalayan sea salt. Good for you. It's a rock. Right? Because it's not going to melt in your oven unless your oven's really hot. Right, so can y'all look at multiple choice question number one real quick? Page 39. Y'all go ahead and turn and talk to each other.
Can y'all get rid of any of the answered choices? A. a. Okay, A. So why do you want to get rid of A? Because it is no So? It's ionic. It's supposed to be ionic. So? Why, would, why does it have to be ionic? Because it conducts electricity. It conducts electricity, not in the solid form that like we talked about. I was giving you the answer. But it does conduct electricity in an aqueous solution. So we know it's got to be ionic. So A is out. C is out. C is out. Why is that? Silicon is a non-metal. Okay. What about anything else you want to get rid of? D. 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 Doesn't doesn't D conduct electricity? Wait, it, it, wait, wait, whoa, ho, ho. Wait a minute. Are you telling me that that copper doesn't conduct electricity in solution? It might, but conducts electricity as a solid. Right, it does conduct electricity as a solid. And it also would conduct electricity, but the bigger thing, what does the powder look like? White. It's a white powder. Y'all ever seen some copper? Y'all ever seen a penny? What color is copper? Copper color. Copper color. If your penny is a white powder, you got other issues. So this is not a matter, and this is true on so many AP questions, this is not a matter of what is the answer. It's a matter of what ain't the answer. You got rid of D, because copper does conduct electricity as a solid, it's a metal. It ain't A, as y'all called out, because that's not ionic. And it ain't C, because that's a metal. I mean, that's a non-metal, silicon dioxide. So the correct answer is B. Exactly what y'all said. Right. Have y'all ever heard of a covalent network solid? No. Okay. So this is y'all got a couple spots to write write down through here. So let's go ahead and talk about that. Ladies, what is your best friend? What lasts forever? Diamonds. Diamonds. Okay. Diamonds last forever. Diamonds are a girl's best friend. Oh. <laughs> right? No. So, and guys, they don't last forever. You know what really lasts forever? Soot. <laughs> well, y'all, have y'all talked about entropy? Yeah. Everything's headed downhill. All diamonds are turning into graphite pencil lead. All graphite's turning into soot sooner or later. So if you want something to give your personal uh, bestie to show that your love is eternal, just give them some soot. <laughs> just take your finger inside of a chimney, rub some black smudgy stuff, and say, here you go. This is what I think about you, honey. <laughs> and it's free. Don't do that. Well, you go to prom with me, smear. All right. So, diamond is nothing but covalent bonds all the time. And by and large, covalent bonds are the strongest of bonds. So, there's a little bit of overlap with ionic, but by and large, covalent bonds are incredibly strong. So, when you jump in the shower and the water hits you and bounces off, are you breaking that hydrogen-oxygen bond? Are you splitting the water into hydrogens and oxygen? No. 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 If you did, that'd be weird. 
and your bathroom would be full of explosive gas. You'd be at the beach, you're going to light a fire and have a nice, you know, and the wave would come crashing in, and it would turn into hydrogen oxygen, and the whole world would explode. <laughs> Which is not the world we live in, right? So you're breaking those intermolecular forces. The, that covalent bond is really strong. So a covalent network solid is nothing more than a solid that's all covalent bonds all the time. And I've got three examples for y'all of these covalent network solids. First of them, diamonds. <coughs> the second one, and you guys have probably heard of this before, is called sand. You guys ever heard of sand before? Right? What is the formula for sand? Does anybody know? Silicon dioxide. SiO2. You ever melted glass before? Can't you just rub sand between your hands and it makes glass? Ever done that? Yeah, me neither. <laughs> right? Because it's hard to melt it, right? So, so those are super strong bonds. And do you know where that sand came from? The ocean. Okay. <laughs> the ocean just makes sand? <laughs> that sand came from a mountain that eroded. And if you take granite, a type of rock that's very super hard, and probably most of your kitchen countertops have granite on in the summer, and you break that apart into <laughs> tiny little pieces, you get sand. So that granite, that silicon dioxide, that diamond, those are all the things that are covalent network solids. So if you're ever asked who has the highest melting point, it's going to be one of these. Prior to 2014, when they rewrote the AP exam, this was always a question. Which of the following has the highest melting point? And it was either sand, diamond, or granite. Every time. Silicon dioxide. So, these things are so strong that they have an extremely high melting point. Now, if you go back to this question, and the question had silicon dioxide, would you expect it to melt at a measly 320 degrees? Oh, no, no, no. No, no, no. You'd expect it to melt at a much higher temperature. So that was the other clue that it can't be silicon dioxide. Oh, that's what it was. Yeah, everybody over here is very distracted. There's a, there's a dead roach on the floor. I was like, what is everybody over here doing? And then he left, and then I should have looked. Okay. <laughs> A bug. There's a big bug, too. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, now, now that you know that, so covalent network solids you may have not heard of before, but now you've got some clue to that. Y'all talk about question number two real quick. Turn and talk to each other. In which of those are covalent bonds broken? And this is actually from an old AP exam, y'all. All of these multiple choice questions are from an old AP exam. <laughs> what we remember from chemistry. There's two types of forces in molecules. There's the one inside molecules. Intra, inside molecular, that's a covalent ionic kind of thing. And then there's inter molecular forces between two molecules. Let's see if y'all can name a couple of those. Do y'all remember those forces? There's a hydrogen bond, London dispersion forces, Dipole, dipole. Okay, what? Okay, right? So we've got these different types of forces. So really the question is asking, 
which ones are covalent inside and which ones are intermolecular between. So did y'all find an answer? And for those of you who got scared and were ready to not take AP chemistry because of the math in the first session, does this make you feel any better about the AP exam? No. No? Okay. Well, <laughs> always a bad sign. All right. I2, solid turning to I2 gas. What types of forces are those? Let's draw it out. You got an intermolecular, I mean, you got an I2 and another I2. They're stuck together in a solid with this force of attraction in between them. That's the one we're breaking. We're not turning I2 into two separate I's running around. We're breaking the solid into a liquid by breaking this bond. What kind of a force exists between two molecules? Intermolecular, not covalent. The covalent is here, holding the one together. So it's that good. ain't it. It's good. It's fine. Letter B. What kind of force are we doing there? Same thing. Same thing. The molecule is still intact. See, what kind of bond are we breaking there? This is, ionic. that's ionic, right? So that wouldn't be covalent at all. And this one we're taking diamond, which you know is a covalent network bond, all covalent all the time, and you're turning it into individual carbons floating around as a gas. So the answer has to be D. D. All right, so let's talk about metals just for a moment. You got a spot there to write down what we know about metals? So, metals are things that want to lose electrons or things that want to gain electrons. What do metals want to do? They like to lose, because remember, metals become positive ions. So metals are always looking at trying to give away electrons. <coughs> so what happens when a bunch of metals hang out? They're like, hey, you want an electron? Mm -hmm. No, hey, do you want an electron? No, hey, do you... It's like getting a bunch of Girl Scouts together, and everybody's trying to sell Girl Scout cookies to each other. Ain't nobody buying it. <laughs> So metals live in this state of really a positive center, the nucleus, with these electrons out around them that are kind of loosely held. Those outermost valence electrons, they would just love for somebody to take those electrons. And why do they want somebody to take those electrons? I remember why they give away electrons in the first place. Right, they want to look like the, a noble gas. They want to have eight valence electrons. They want to have a full octet, however you say it. So they're looking at giving them away. So if you had an old beat-up car that you were just hoping somebody would steal, what would you do? Leave the keys in it, unlocked, open the door, with the engine running, and a sign, be back. Tomorrow. These electrons are just like that car you left out there. They're very loosely held. And since they're very loosely held, since they're not tightly held, we often describe of it as nuclei floating around in a sea of electrons. So metals have this layer of electrons that aren't rigidly bound. So if you take two metals and try to slide them past each other, totally okay. You try to take salt, sodium chloride, and try to slide those sodiums and chlorides against each other. And those sodium, sodium, when they get next to each other, sodium like, I don't like you, you're a positive charge. And the other sodium is like, I don't like you either, you're also a positive charge. That force of repulsion will actually cause that thing to break. So I call it hit it with a hammer. If you hit a piece of salt with a hammer, what happens? Does it spread out into a nice thin sheet? No, that would be weird. This piece of concrete isn't big enough. Hit it with a hammer. And just push it with a rolling pin. Just roll it out like pie dough. It's not how it works. That concrete is just like 
rock. It's just like salt. Got those ions interlocked very tightly held. Metals with this very loose array of electrons allows them to slide past each other. Because of this, we develop things like ductility <coughs> and malleability. The idea is you can hit it with a hammer and make it thin. You can force it into a wire. It's just like pasta. You can make it whatever shape that you want it to. You don't have to hit it with a hammer. But, well, you can, but I wouldn't recommend it. Right? Now, does anybody have a gold necklace on? Or gold jewelry of any kind? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I don't want to get jumped. No. Uh, if you had a solid gold necklace on, that thing could be ripped right off your neck because the solid gold is so incredibly weak because it's not a super strong metal. So, how do you make a super strong metal out of gold? You add stuff to it. And what do we call it when we mix two metals together? Those are called alloys. So, when you've got alloys of things, you can either do one of two things. See this positive guy right here? We can either take him out and replace him with another metal. In other words, substitute. Or, do you all see another place where you might be able to put in a metal? We could substitute one, take one out, we could take him out and replace it. Y'all see something else you could put in there? What if you had a tiny little metal? Where could a tiny little metal live? We could put tiny little metal atoms in between. So you can either substitute, take one out, replace it with another one, or you could put another metal that fits in between those, and that is called, I don't know if you all know this word or not, interstitial. So two types of alloys in the world, you all might write it down for metallic money, two types of alloys. There's interstitial, which is where we put a metal to live in between the gaps in the existing metal. Or it's called a substitutional alloy where we take one of the metal atoms out and replace it with another one. And that's how we make alloys. So that your car doesn't break. And it stretches. Instead of cracking into a million pieces. If your car's made of metal. Which is harder to So the interstitial is one where you fit smaller metals in the gaps between them, and the substitutional is where you take out some of the existing metals and replace them with another. Does that sound reasonable so far? All right, this one, number three. Now in order to do this, you're going to have to find nickel and 